Um, that ends the upper limb part. Uh, the lower limb, I think there's a little bit less to say, but just as interesting. And ankle fractures is, is what drove me nuts at Zitulele in the Transkai. What people need in the Transkai is legs to walk on. Arms maybe not so important. I, I say this with the greatest respect, but if you can't walk where there's no roads, you're in trouble. And I probably wrote more disability grants for people that never got their ankle fractures operated and had severe osteoarthritis than I saw ankle fractures operated when I worked in the trans guys. So I'm very passionate about this. And I think we need to be able to pick the right ones to fight for. And that's why ankle fractures is, is very important. I think the very simple way to look at this is what is the Weber classification? And I've got on the picture that, so the Weber A, B, and C, and we'll look at some x-rays here. Um, the Weber A is a simple, it's below the syndesmosis, um, Weber fractures look at the fibula, this important, ironically, for such a relatively unimportant bone, we classify ankle fractures according to what happens to the distal end of the, of the fibula, but I think it's because the distal end of the fibula is a very important part of the joint of the ankle. So the Weber A is a stable fracture, you pop it six weeks, they do well. Don't bother the arthropod, don't fight for this one. Um, and the fracture is below the, the distal edge of the mortar. So if you look at the line of the joint, the horizontal, the Weber A is below that. The Weber B is on and above the level. It's that area where the fibula and the tibia touches. And it's usually a oblique fracture, classic example of this um, if this picture is a classic example, I think it's, it's what we see and it's by far the most common fractures, unfortunately, of ankle fractures because the Weber B is some of them we got to operate, some of them we can treat conservatively. The, the trick is to know which or which. So usually we can pop them and the, the, re, the way we decide this is acceptable or not is if you look at the joint space and you follow the joint space through all the way and it doesn't open anywhere. It's perfect um, uh, uh, parallel lines all the way through on an AP. Then you can probably say, I'm gonna treat this conservatively below knee pop six weeks and they should do fine. It's when that space opens um, that you gotta do more. So there's just a little bit more detail. There's a way that B1, B2, B3, the B1 is isolated. Um, B2 is when you get the uh, middle malleolus involved or with ligament injury, which we can't see on the x-ray. And then the B3 is where the posterior malleolus, a B2 plus a posterior malleolus. So that's a, the B2 and B3 are the ones we usually prefer to operate. In the ideal world, most definitely want to operate, but those are the ones that I would actually say, this is, this is the ankle fracture you fight for. So if we look at some pictures, the one on the left is clearly the mortis is disrupted. That the whole joint is opening up, the syndesmosis is ripped. So firstly, you have to reduce this one, just close reduction in the pop, and then this is the one you wanna fight for, for or of. Um, the picture on the right is just a lateral where you can see those fracture lines running through the, through the distal fibula interposed on the, on the tibial um, X-ray. It's difficult sometimes, but the, the lateral X-ray just helps you to see sometimes because sometimes it's so perfectly aligned on the AP that you only see it on the lateral. Um, here's a picture of a Weber A and a Weber B, just very nicely demonstrate the picture on the left below the mortise where the fractures and the, the one on, on the Weber B on the, the picture on the right, clearly that oblique fracture running through. Um, here's another good example of uh, on the left, a Weber B fracture where that you can see the joint space at the medial malleolus opening up with some calcification of the ligaments there, so probably old injury, but that space is opening up and this patient needed ORF. He got the ORF and you can see by just fixing that um, fibula, you pull the whole um, joint into place and the mortise is, you know, the joint space is beautifully intact all the way around. So there you can see. Weber C is above the, above the level of syndesmosis. It is always unstable and it needs an ORF. So this is the other one we need to fight for. 
Um, and I think this is very important. This patient will have severe, severe osteoarthritis and not be able to walk on this leg within five years if we don't operate it. I might sound a little bit dram dramatic, but I've seen this so many times, young people that cannot walk on a, on a painful ankle. And the disability afterwards and the big operations, um, doing arthrodesis for ankle is a big operation, is, is quite, yeah, it's, it's very, very big big problem for them afterwards. So I think it's worth fighting for these ones. Remember to not be caught out by the isolated, call it a defensive fracture of the distal of the fibula. And we see this when, for instance, in the case of they come in with soccer, they come in with a tackle from the side, bam, 90 degrees on the fibula and the fibula just snaps in that contact spot. So it's, it's also almost like direct trauma on the fibula defensive fracture. And those ones, this is not a Weber C. This is just a treatment with a, you can kind of a below knee pop um, or a moon boot, even if you're lucky to have one available. And they do very well. This is not a Weber C. Weber C is where the joint is usually involved. And it looks like this picture where the, that whole joint space opens up. So um, here's another picture of a Weber C. And where the, um, uh, the screw there actually goes right through the fibula into the tibia. You've got to take it out later on after it's healed, but that just pulls the whole syndesmosis into place so that it can heal beautifully and, and the whole joint is then um, more stable. Um, it's a very severe case of a, a Weber C where the medial malleolus is also fractures, definitely the one to fight for. Um, and then I looked up because I was worried about this when I was in the Eastern Cape, I looked at a lot of articles and in principle, um, a Weber A is usually a fracture that really needs operate, to be operated. Weber C's are unstable, needs operation. But Weber B's are the one where there is a gray area. And I think if you see the joint space beautifully in place, the mortise intact, it's not opening up on the malleoli. You can pop it, accept it. And that's probably the one not worth fighting for operation. The ones where the joint is disrupted, definitely the ones to fight for. Um, last, I think this is my last slide on ankle fractures. When we were really desperate, because we were, as I said, not getting ankles operated. Um, we quite often did close reductions for ankles, but still you can't get this, the, the joint in place. We tried what we call the banana, um, banana pop. And it's literally where you would put the foot in equinus with the toes downwards. So it's, it's a, anatomically the wrong way to POP the patient. So what we would do is you, you put the foot down um, in equinus and internal rotation, and then you mold on over the malleola the POP when you reduce it. And if you take the x-ray down quite often that position, just pulling the foot into internal rotation equinus kind of like pulls the, the, the um, distal fibula that's fractured into space, uh, into the right place and close the joint space beautifully. And then we left them like that for a week. We obviously you can't leave them for the whole six weeks because that ankle, you've got to get an ankle um, should be in 90 degrees when you uh, put on a POP. But then we would just for one week, bring them back. It's nice and sticky. You can take the POP off and then POP them in the correct position with molds over the molding or pressure over the um, malleola and, and surprisingly good results in desperate times. So that's a, a trick to try. So the tibia, I think a lot of us that's worked in secondary tertiary or private settings or in good secondary hospitals, all the tibias got um, pins, got, you know, so, so one could tend to think that's the way to go, but actually you can treat tibia conservatively with exceptional results. It's, it's the risk of infection is less, the risk of non-union is less. They do very, very well with close, close um, conservative management, but it takes longer. And I think for our economically active, if we want to fight for a tibia pin, it's probably the patients that work. Our economically active patients, the big sports people try for them. Other patients, if that tibia is well aligned, 
conservative management is great therapy, great treatment and it will leave them with a very very functional normal leg afterwards so it's not inferior is what i'm trying to say so i think pick the right ones to fight there but um conservative management if it's well aligned is fine what is well aligned um angulation on the tibia is not taken well and i hope this picture on the left demonstrates it. if you've got a femur fracture and it angulates the ball joint is a 360 degree joint kind of like it just the the, the joint just moves into another space and it's not as i'm not explaining that very well but but it's because it's a 360 joint it just moves to another position and a little bit of angulation on the femur is not the end of the world we, we prefer good, ang uh, no angulation on weight bearing on the legs compared to the arms. Angulated bone in the arm is not as possibly devastating as the leg. But in the femur, it's not as bad because the hip joint can correct. But the tibia runs into the linear joint of the, of the ankle. That's basically anterior posterior movement. And if there's angulation, they say more than 5%, uh, five degrees on the AP, then you're going to get a pin load on that ankle and you're going to get on osteoarthritis soon. So I think this is actually worth getting, uh, not worth, it's absolutely essential getting the tibia in a good position. So yeah, I explained that now. So undisplaced tibial fractures in kids, they get this, this is a nice picture of a green stick fracture of the distal um, tibia, beautiful position. They're going to, um, remodelate anyway beautifully so pop it four weeks for a four-year-old child eight weeks for eight-year-old child 12 weeks for a 12-year-old child you pick it up up on the rhythm yeah the pattern so it's roughly a week per year and then after 12 weeks we manage them as adults two to four months yet again like i mentioned earlier if this is an older patient that smokes and uses steroids they're going to take way longer to so that's probably four months in a POP versus two months in a young, healthy, non-smoking, active um, young patient. So um, take that into account. But the tibias um, heal quite well. So the picture on the left, excellent um, one to use conservative management. The one in the middle, there's angulation there. Um, and I would actually like to measure that on the x-ray usually most of the programs we we get our digital x-rays on can measure angles for us if that's more than five degrees this is a good candidate to put on a pop try and reduce it close reduction in the pop while you're putting it on and i'll show you how to do that now but then if you don't get it right to wedge it and i'll also have a slide on which so what's the rules and this this is like that slide on the hand what what angles for the metacarpals is acceptable. This is the slide for the tibia. You need to have less than five degrees valgus or varus angulation. In other words, if you look at it on the 8P, less than five degrees, that's very tight, but very important. You can't have angulation on the tibia. Um, on the, if you look from the lateral side, you can accept up to 10 degrees. And why can you accept more? Because the joint will just move forward or backwards if you get that angle. Um, so you can, it's actually very forgiving, 10 degrees. Um, you can accept up to 10 degrees rotational deformity, um, up to one centimeter of shortening, and up to 50% of cortical contact. So bones need to... Uh, overlap at least 50%, which is very, very forgiving. But I think the important one, if you look at the AP extra at the tibia, less than five degrees. So just, this is a drawing I tried to make to just demonstrate to you how tight five degrees is, because you look at it and you say, oh, that's five degrees. But if you actually measure it, that first picture is six degrees. It doesn't cover, oh, oh there, six degrees. The middle one is 11 degrees. And the last one is, I think, 23 degrees. It's behind your pictures now. Um, but so it's, it's very tight. Um, and if you just look at it and it looks fine, go and measure it because five degrees is the cutoff. It's very important. If you sit with a patient now with six degrees or 10 degrees of angulation, 
then you can go sit like the picture in the middle of this slide nicely demonstrates how to reduce a tibia. Get the patient to sit on the edge of the bed, something behind the upper leg so that the lower leg can hang down freely with gravity. Then you sit in front of the patient and you can actually then give good manipulation there, obviously within reason, analgesia on board, some morphine. It's not terribly painful, so morphine is usually enough here. And then I, what I do is I put on a POP for the lower leg, get it into the, you know, manipulate the way I want it, hold it till that POP dry. Then I help the patient lie down and I extend the POP up to the upper leg. So remember, tibia fracture, you cannot just um, pop the lower leg. You need to go upper leg, joint above, joint below. Um, so that's... That's close reduction. Then you've done the close reduction. You do the x-ray afterwards. You say, oh, you measure it. It's still eight degrees. I can't accept that. Then what you can do is a wedge. And a wedge is quite simply nice mechanism. I used to, every hospital I work, I've got a couple of wooden blocks that I cut at home, about two centimeter, centimeter half by centimeter and half. And I just leave it in casualty for the day needed for this. So what I do is I take the pop saw. I take off two thirds on just make sure you cut on the right side where you should be cutting. And then as you push that pop open, you slip in that um, block of wood and that you can just imagine how that would manipulate the, the bone. Also the pressure over time, it, you know, over the next couple of hours, it's going to straighten that leg actually nicely. And you, you can win a couple of degrees beautifully there and get that tibia straight. Um, then afterwards, I just drop, run POP over that and um, it closes the gap again. Um, do you remember, there's something I wanted to say about, here's a nice picture. Um, think about before you cut that two thirds that you cut in the right. Quite a lot of people tell me they cut on the wrong side. Oh, and another, that's what I wanted to say. The POP need to be dry. So you need 24 hours for the POP to dry, if it's very humid, if you're sitting in the in the rainy season, the trans sky, it's it might even take a longer time. Otherwise, it's still soft, and as you open that up, you put in the block, it's just going to squish and you know misform. Um, it's not going to work. But this is a nice way to to win a couple of extra degrees. Um, open tibia fractures is very common, and we need to take them of all open fractures very very seriously because the blood supply to the tibia is poor. If you get an open fracture here and you get infected, they probably going to run in, you know, best case scenario, venous stasis, ulcers there in the lower leg, worst case scenario, amputation. So we need to debride it. But to remember, if you look at the top picture, that's uh, X-Fix. So X-Fix we use when there's an open fracture with a lot of soft tissue damage and you can't go and do RF. You still need to have to heal that, but you need to immobilize the leg. Then we put in the X-Fix, beautiful. It looks so cool, very nice to, to, to the operation, but we don't have it in rural hospital. So what do we do in rural hospital? We do our own rural X-Fix. You clean, wash out the wound, you put some jello net on it, you close, you put on a POP over that whole leg, then you leave it for 24 hours, and then you cut out the windows to be able to, cl to clean the wounds, to continue doing the dressings. It's about the same thing. A bit just a little bit more primitive and cheaper, but you, you do in, in essence the same as a as a X fix if that's not available. And then we clean as soon as the wounds are healed, we can do a full POP. Moving on to femur shaft fractures, hip fractures. So in the absence of x-rays, like we've had at Zitulele, we, we kind of often have to 